which fell in. Thank you. Um, Rogers Kalisa is a doctoral research fellow in learning analytics at the Department of Education, University of Oslo in Norway. His doctoral research focuses on using learning analytics and in particular learning analytics dashboards as a tool to support teachers in making data informed learning design decisions in blended learning environments. Now he is also interested in mobile learning, virtual reality, and multimodal learning analytics. His research utilizes networked approaches, e.g. social and um, epistemic network analysis, and automated discourse analysis to make sense of students' data generated from online learning environments and how it relates to teachers' intended um, pedagogical objectives. Now, he currently serves um, on the executive committee of the Society of Learning Analytics Research, um, that's SOLA in abbreviation, elected as a student member and co-leads SOLA Special Interest um, Working Group. Now, at the end of the session, um, we are hoping to have a couple of minutes for question and, uh, questions and answers. Um, please do introduce yourselves um, at that time. Um, and maybe even during um, the session, if you do have any questions, please add them to the chat, and then we can follow up um, on those questions um, during our Q&A session. Um, the recording and the presentation will all um, be shared at the end of today's session. Um, and so, may I please welcome um, Roger Kalisa. We really look forward to wonderful learnings as we've experienced all through the day today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Bradley, for that interesting uh, presentation. I just I just want to confirm uh, before I start talking. Uh, which slides are you seeing? I have two screens, so I have to be make sure that I have. You have the right uh, view. Do you have the full screen, or you have one with the with the with the other one with the some notes? Are you able to see the full screen? We see the full screen, Rogers. Thank okay. you. That's great. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, thank you so much uh, for the uh, for the introduction, Bradley. And uh, just like uh, Bradley said, I'll be discussing uh, levering learning analytics uh, dashboard support teaching and learning. And uh, first of all, I thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about this topic. And uh, I look forward to sharing uh, my experience and. Uh, perspectives and also look forward to having a fruitful uh, discussion with uh, all the <coughs> participants uh, regarding the topic of uh, learning analytics uh, dashboards. Uh, just in a uh, brief, I'll start with a brief presentation of uh, myself uh, besides uh, what uh, Bradley uh, talked about. So my, I'm currently uh, completing a PhD uh, in uh, learning analytics at the University of Oslo. And uh, I submitted my thesis, which was entitled Designing Learning Analytics Tools for Teachers with Teachers. And uh, I completed my Master of Education in, uh, at the University of Adelaide in Australia, and then uh, Master of Development in, uh, at the University of Agde in Norway. And then uh, my Bachelor's uh, in Adult and Community Education uh, at Macquarie University. And as Bradley said, I'm currently the student member representative on the Society of Learning Analytics uh, executive. So just like you can see uh, in, uh, from my background, I realized that, uh, um, sorry, sometimes I look at the chat, so I'm, I'm trying. So I'm, I'm, my background is more in the education uh, area, so I'm more from the pedagogical perspective and just like Ayushan, I've been uh, researching learning analytics from the learning uh, learning and learning sciences perspective, and not so much from the technical perspective. But in my discussion, as we'll see, involves decisions regarding technical aspects. But I'll take you through how 
how I've been uh, managing and working with this uh, along the along my doctor project. And my presentation is going to be much uh, focused on my work in the doctor project, but in particular, trying to understand what learning analytics dashboards are. And as you saw like in the previous presentation, I won't be diving much into examples because uh, uh, Dr. Ishan did a lot of that work. But my work will be more of, okay, if we have learning, if we are interested in uh, designing learning analytics dashboards, what's the process and how do we go about this? Because what are some of the things we need to consider? What kind of steps do we take as a, as a stakeholders at different levels? Because I know in this meeting, we, are, we have individuals, we have experts from different perspectives all doing uh, participating in different roles in the different academic institutions, either as uh, teachers or advisors or as uh, researchers. So I think we'll be touching on those different elements. And I think some of the questions that came from the previous session would be possibly uh, discussed in this session. How do we design dashboards that are possibly aligned with the needs of the stakeholders? And this could be teachers or students. My examples will be mainly from the teacher perspective because that's where my, my, my focus of the PhD was. But we are also going to see that the experiences and the lessons from whatever I'm going to be talking about are so applicable and transferable to whatever other context we can think about. So um, maybe one thing I didn't talk about I, is that I'm originally from Uganda. So I just moved to uh, to Norway for my studies. So with, we'll talk about dashboards, what they are, we already know, and then we have an activity. We plan to have two activities if time allows, and I think we should do that so that we have more interactions as well. And then briefly talk about challenges in learning analytics dashboards implementation, and then try to demonstrate an example of a learning analytics dashboard. Uh, and then we have time to do some, uh, have some discussions and also uh, questions uh, with the with all the participants. So the the objective is to at least have. Uh, a general overview of what learning analytics dashboards are and how they are developed from a participatory perspective. One of the one of the participants highlighted the issue of uh, we need to involve teachers, we need to involve students, and it's an example I'm going to demonstrate here how I try to work from a participatory approach to develop uh, learning analytics dashboards for for teachers in uh, authentic practice. So, just like uh, Ishan talked about, in general. Dashboards or learning analytics dashboards are visual displays that summarize and visualize information for teachers based or students based on students' learning patterns and interactions. And this is a very general uh, uh, definition, and it also relates to what uh, Ishan has been talking about. Like, I mean, it's just a it's it's a dashboard, just like we have dashboards for cars, just like we have a dashboard for different metrics, or even on our phones, giving you a summary of what's actually happening. But the difference between the dashboard, for example, a car dashboard, which shows the, your 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 like speedometers and and uh, like fuel consumption and all that kind of stuff. It's a summary. You don't know what's happening in the car, but the dashboard is helping us to summarize this information and displaying it in a way that is actually easy and simple for us to understand. So it's it combines dashboards usually combine uh, automated analysis techniques and interactive visualizations uh, to help us to interpret and understand the phenomena. And in this case for learning analytic dashboards, it's about learning. It's about displaying all this kind of information about different learners. On the right, this is a, an example of a figure from a Open, Open Universal Analysis uh, Dashboard, which shows different metrics about what students are doing and who, which student has submitted the assignments. And this is an example that will be, I think that will be uh, highlighted more in more details in the next presentation where uh, Professor Bart will be discussing about implementation of such dashboards at scale. Uh, from a open university learning uh, open university uh, perspective, so there are a couple of uh, resources. Uh, I won't really dig much into this because we have been having a lot of uh, literature about this. But there are a couple of uh, there's a lot of literature. Like if you want to dive into dashboards, on like reviews, I, I picked out in particular reviews on learning analytics dashboards. So there is one by Jivet uh, and others licensed to evaluate or prepare analytics dashboards for education practice. There is one on student facing learning analytics dashboards. There is one that is talking about pitfalls of learning analytics dashboards. What are some of the issues we need to be aware of? And then there's one on the student facing learning, learning analytics dashboard. So there is a lot of literature uh, out there. And of course, I'll share this presentation and you can follow uh, the different literature in more detail. 
uh, later as we as we move on. So examples of metrics that we can actually <laughs> Uh, that we can uh, capture from uh, from uh, learning analysis dashboards, just like we saw the examples from before. It could be session sessions versus total users, like uh, our users using this uh, particular uh, kind of resource completion rate. This could be very important for especially for institutions that are worried about their retention rates in in uh, institutions. You could be tracking how many students are likely to fail, how many students are likely to to complete the program and if they will not, I mean, we have been talking about predictive analytics, uh, trying to understand the, the likelihood that someone is, will be dropping out and how do you actually intervene? User statistics, who is using what kind of resources, device type, what devices are being used, session times, poor results, what questions are not easier for students. I mean, there are a couple of, uh, there, there's a range of things, drop off or user navigation. There are so many things we can navigate, we can capture, we can uh, look at in these kind of dashboards. But the, the most important thing is that there are so many users, but in the end, it will be actually up to the, 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 the user or the intended users or the stakeholders, who is the, who is the, 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 the uh, target audience for whatever dashboard that we are going to actually develop. That will determine what kind of metrics and what kind of examples or data we are actually going to collect. So at this juncture, actually, to make a little bit, because I want us to move, in a way that we, tr we try to reflect on our own practice, because like in the end of the workshop, if you are if you're a teacher, if you're a researcher, if you are an institutional manager, if you are whatever role you are playing in your institution, if you want to develop a dashboard, because like in this session, I'm, I'm assuming that we get, we get through all this process. I want us to get through, uh, to go through an activity where we try to reflect on the, on the, on the on the how do we plan and design dashboards and and in this case one of the activity i want us to go through is to whatever role we take we go through we we have i mean we are going to realize that we are maybe in the different groups we we'll have we may we might have different roles but if you can identify the roles if there is something in particular that's common among you maybe you are advisors or researchers or teachers i want i, I want us to discuss like what kind of pedagogical issue or challenge, because we are talking about learning analytics. So we are trying to resolve, we are trying to, to, to use learning analytics to help us with the particular pedagogical challenges we are facing. And we are going to discuss, so based on that challenge and taking a learning analytics perspective, what kind of data is available about students that we could support us to deal with such a problem? For example, you could say, me in man, my managerial role, maybe we have a problem with retention or like, we have dropout rates, like the dropout rate is very high. So what kind of, if we are to use learning analytics as a tool uh, to help us uh, uh, deal with such a problem, what kind of information is available that we can actually utilize? And then based on that information, what's the best way to present this information? Either to the teachers, if at all students are dropping out, what kind of individuals, what kind of stakeholders do you want to actually to target? Do you want to produce, give this information back to the teachers? Do you want to give it to the students? Do you want to give it to the advisors? And this highlights like the level of intervention, of course, like how do we intervene? Because learning analytics collected without intervention is, is not useful. So we have, to act, we have to act, we have to, to respond, we have to take action based on the analytics we collect. So I want us to have this uh, simple or uh, kind of a quick discussion about this kind of aspects. How do we, uh, how do we engage into, uh, uh, how do we identify a problem and what, how do we decide on what kind of data we can actually use and how do we, uh, what kind of way, what ways do we actually use to, to, uh, to design or to present this kind of information. And I hope this kind of discussion will help us to, uh, uh, to go through the, to go through the, uh, the, the next process that we're going to, uh, we're going to have. Yes, I'm going to share the 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 the, the link uh, just shortly. Uh, and of course, I'll, I'll be. I'll try to. Uh, I hope. I hope uh, Bradley, I'm able to create rooms from my side. Maybe no. Uh, but if not, uh, I mean, you can. Uh, 
I think I'm unable to do that. Maybe you can help me uh, create seven rooms. This can be like, uh, you can just do it automatically right. because I mean, we can split and then we'll be back in 15 minutes. So we have like that Google Docs has like group one, group two, group three. So I think if we, I think the, 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 the zoom the zoom will create automated rooms up to so you can create seven rooms and then wherever right. you are you are sent please work with that and then we're back in 15 minutes 15 minutes all right no yes thank you so that's uh, 45 past 12. so i've i've opened um all rooms and um please, you should be able to join. Um, may you go ahead and join those rooms and we should be back here at 12.45. Um, if if ever if anyone is having a problem, please do let me know. Um, the rooms must be open for for everybody now. Um, I think we still have a few people here. Um, yeah, please so, let me. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. yeah, maybe some people might be a little bit busy or something like that. So okay, all I right. Think that should be yeah fine because. But I think the 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 pop up is available for everybody. So if they come, they might join. At okay. Some point. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Yeah, but maybe you can stay in this room just in case okay. uh, someone is popping up. I'll just go to. I'll join one of the rooms to. All right, you know, all right. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm one of those who are still here. I I just need to attend to something else quickly first. <laughs> all right. Noted. Thank you for that. Um, Bradley. I'm actually just here for for SAA social media, so I won't be joining the breakout rooms. Noted. All right. Thank you very much.
um, Rogers, um, I'll be closing the breakout rooms now. Yes, that's very fine. I think that's uh, in time. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone has been given 60 seconds to leave. Yep, great. Okay, so welcome. I think uh, most of us are now back from the breakout rooms. Uh, I see, I see. Yeah. So I think without uh, wasting much time, I'll, I'll uh, what we'll do is to uh, just have a very quick uh, reflection from uh, each group of what you talked about. Like, I mean, you just give a highlight whether there is anything in particular you highlighted or you talked about in particular or in in relation to learning analytics or a challenge in your area and what kind of data and how do you how do you deal with that? It could be something in general that you have talked about in, in line with the uh, dashboards or uh, using data to actually deal with some pedagogical challenges. So I'll start with the uh, group one. Uh, Abdul, Abdul, Abdul Bak, do you have a question? I think you, there is. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. I wanted to ask initially, hi. Um, if you wanted us to capture our responses on the on the um, Google Doc because I couldn't edit it, but I just made notes on my side, is that fine? Yes. So I I thought I, yeah I wanted people to uh, uh, to present through the Google Docs because I, I didn't not so many people recorded there, but I think it will be it will be great to keep these notes because we can share share them at the end uh, but but for now we can just give a, a very quick update but i will, i would really encourage you to put your responses there so that we share this as a resource at the end uh, of the discussion thanks yeah so anyone from group one to just give a quick highlight um i, I can come in i think my colleagues were struggling with connectivity very briefly, we didn't have a lot of time. We had identified uh, from a managerial driven point of view, student support and uh, student success, especially taking into account that um, we are operating in an increasingly digital environment where there's uh, reduced uh, contact time between um, students and, and, and lecturers and um, ensuring that uh, students are adequately supported and ensuring that the student uh, success is, is monitored and improved. Those, that was the kind of the, the key element that we highlighted for the first section. And then thinking about the first section and having to answer to the data that is available um, about students that could support dealing with student support and student success, um, our view was that um, this data would have to come from the virtual learning environment. Uh, so from systems like uh, learning management uh, systems, uh, proctoring systems for, for online examinations um, and other learning supporting systems, uh, um, uh, libraries, uh, et cetera, um, uh, that, that would be the sort of the data points that we thought would, would be quite key in, in terms of uh, um, supporting the, 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 uh, the first issue that we highlighted. And of course, in thinking about um, uh, section B, for the for the kind of information that we would be hoping to be getting out, um, understanding things like um, uh, student participation, for example, is a student engaging in learning activities? Uh, what is the rate of their participation? What is their grading? Especially looking at it from the smallest um, or the earliest possible uh, intervention point, uh, such as um, grading of learning activities um, uh, on the LMS, 
um, or even looking at how much time uh, are they are they spending on the LMS, etc. And and in terms of uh, the last question, we had not actually uh, covered that particular question, but um, naturally. Um, you know, we, 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 we would think of, you know, a, a platform, a web platform that can, um, you know, capture this information uh, virtually um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an interactive dashboard or paginated report or any other data visualization tool and, uh, you know, make this tool sort of um, accessible and, and publishable to all that would, you know, need to access uh, that information. Um, uh, colleagues from Group One, I, I, I think I've captured our um, our discussion points, but anyone can contribute if we missed anything. Thanks. That's very very helpful. I mean, that sort of information. I think what you highlight about the like LMS is that I mean, just like Aishan uh, mentioned, that's the main source of data usually for dashboards. And I think you have this was very interesting. And I think in the next discussion, we'll see maybe if we are to, if we want to capture participation and this kind of information, how do we, what kind of dashboard and how, in what kind of format can it actually be uh, to present this kind of information back to either to the teacher or to the student. So this was, this was really interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, group two, anyone? I think Ashton, yeah. Yes, thanks for confirming, Bradley. Um, we were just talking about uh, dashboards are very helpful for, for overviews, but unless people are actually trained in reading and interpreting those dashboards or even have an appreciation for uh, the usefulness of data, it's not going to be effective. Um, it's not going to be utilized. So, I mean, in the analogy that Roger offered of driving a car, unless a person understands a speedometer, um, they're, they're not going to be able to engage with anything that's in front of them. So that was something that our group highlighted as something that's we're needing to, um, in our institutions, uh, address. Great. And, and I think, uh, thanks, Esther, for that. I, I think that also drives us to some of the discussions we're going to be having. I mean, it doesn't really help spending a lot of time talking about we know what dashboards are, but the thing is, if we have them in place, are they interpreted? Are they going to be used? And how do we move towards just not designing them towards actually making them useful and usable in practice. And I think we are going to have some discussions. I'll, I'll share some experiences from my own empirical research. And I think uh, Prof. Bat will also add some of the insights uh, implementing learning analytics on scale at the, this, at the Open University and what kind of things, how do we ensure that we design dashboards that are actually usable and making meaning to the users. And that will take us back to issues of theory and connecting theory to analytics is it is it is it just providing beautiful visualizations or what meaning does it actually provide to the user so that's something we're going to highlight so thank you so much uh anything from group three any insights what you talked about uh, thank you very much uh rogers uh, we the specific problem that we looked at was a high dropout rate for first year undergraduate students and we had said in terms of the data which is available, we have both uh, quantitative data, which is in most cases, it is historic. So in the form of Hemi's uh, ac academic performance of the students, but also we, we also have qualitative data, uh, you know, from, from surveys in terms of, uh, you know, student background, uh, looking at issues of mental health, uh, funding, student funding, you know, social uh, psychosocial issues uh, but here what we've identified is the challenge of was most of this information tends to be historic and we want to have you know real-time data that is going to be able to to enable us you know to intervene immediately so i think the issue that we were highlighted was the integration of uh, you know both qualitative and quantitative but also the historic and you know real-time data so that then we're able to do so. So in terms of the real-time data, we identified the learning management system as uh, a, you know, the appropriate platform, looking at the attendance of students, you know, level of engagement. And once we are able to, to do that, and then we should then be able to move into the last uh, phase of intervening. And the dashboards are you know, one form or tool that can then be able to to assist us in terms of looking at the individual students, you know, against their peers in terms of how they are doing, but also 
uh, the issue of the dashboard being simplified, I think that is very important because if it gets too complicated and there's a lot of information and then we, we tend to lose the audience. I think that's what we said. My colleagues can also add things. That's very, very, it's well, very well uh, summarized and you highlight very important aspects of the data is available. And I think this is data that we usually have. We have quantitative data, historic, academic performance, I mean, demographic data, for example, about a student. And then you can have data about from quality uh, surveys or about uh, funding. And then you also highlight something very important about real time uh, data. So it, this is something very important in analytics. Like we, we usually talk about like, uh, analytics like on the fly, right? You want to make, uh, uh, you want to make some kind of, uh, 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 some kind of uh, interventions on the fly. You don't want to wait until a student has dropped out to intervene, right? So it's about how do we balance between the information that we already uh, have uh, in our systems, but also real-time data and how do we provide real-time feedback. And I think we are going to share some of the insights. Uh, I'll share some insights about my how I worked with the real-time dashboard and how we can actually provide real-time statistics. Some insights from group four, anyone? Hi, um, so I will just speak on behalf of um, group four. So um, just a summary of all that we were put together, um, looking at the challenges, um, we highlighted that um, getting the students to engage with the online environment is the first challenge because if they do not engage with the um, online environment, which, is, which could be the learning management system, then you don't have data to analyze. So that's the first challenge. And one way we, we thought about you know, um, improving on that is ensuring that um, it, it's about the design you know, of your course in the learning management system where you um, kind of put restrictions to specific things or activities to ensure that they, they must engage with an activity before maybe they can get a result or maybe before they can move on to the next phase of their learning process. So that's one way of ensuring that students engage with the learning management system. Then you would have enough data to, to analyze and make decisions. Um, we talked about technical ability and skills. Um, in as much as this might be done by um, the tech guys uh, that's from the IT department, but it's it's um, if you do not understand how this is be how this is how this has been developed how it's working, you might not even want to um, believe in the data because you need to understand that okay this is what this is what is the, this is what is being captured in the database you know and this is how it has been analyzed in order for you to then believe in the data to use it to make um, informed decisions. Then we talked about strategic intelligence, which is understanding the variables that affect the students, um, of, of which um, one of our colleagues indicated that most analytics is focused on first year students. Um, and then the other students are kind of left out and this then affects them going forward. Aside from, you know, you have used analytics to, to improve their their um, learning process from first year, then going forward, are you going to be using these same um, variables, same analytics for um, continuing students or are the different variables you'll be looking at for first year students? And then also acting on these results of, of after analyzing, you know, creating those interventions, how do you then um, use the, the, the um, information and insights you've gotten from the analysis? How do you use it to improve on you. So some people might have the data, but they are not able to act on the data. Um, triangulating the data also is another issue. So you could have um, different, different types of data, maybe um, discussion data in um, forums, um, attendance. How do you then triangulate these to make more um, you know, insights to understand exactly how, um, what is impacting on what or looking at you know, the correlation why this has happened, you know, so that's another thing. And it also speaks to technical ability. Then I think the tools that we, we spoke about, learning management tools, um, some said, uh, so one spoke about the graduation survey, course evaluation. So these are also part of the instruments that would help you to collect specific data about students' um, um, engagements in their learning process. And, and I feel like we've been doing here also polls, you know, like 
um, um, ensuring that students capture different polls um, and there are different engagement tools online now, like the Mentimeter and Co, where you engage students while while um, teaching them, and they're able to, to 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 send feedback about their learning process at that time. Um, so that's all that I have. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was still like a, a very good uh, reflection that you highlight about uh, issues like issues of data interoperability, which is something very, very important in, uh, in analytics and how do we integrate different kind of data sources and what kind of, how do we make sure that we present this data uh, in a form that is actually useful to, to, the, to especially either teachers or students and, and, and the issue of technical ability and skills. I think this is, going, this is something I'm going to keep talking about and like over and over. And I think the best way to do this, we're going to, I mean, I'll highlight briefly about the human-centered approach of learning analytics. I think it will start away from, right away from working with the stakeholders, the people who want to people to use the tools and defining these things together, what makes sense and what doesn't maybe help uh, in whatever different uh, scenarios and aspects. I think it's something very, very key for us to consider during the design process. But we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about some of these uh, aspects uh, even more as we as we proceed with the discussion. So we have. Group five, anyone to highlight just briefly so that we're not caught up by time? I'm happy to talk for group five. Sure. Um, so we, um, some of the issues that we um, identified, one of them was um, looking at what are the ac real accurate predictors um, for student success um, for each or unique and specific context. So, um, yeah, that was was a main aspect, and then also looking at how effective are our student at risk programs. So, um, what data are we needing in order to interpret that and understand that, um, and then how can we use that in order to um, make improvements to the student at risk programs? And then also um, looking at predictors for oh, well, early warning. When is when is early enough? So. So um, when should we identify um, at-risk students and when should we make decisions in order to um, advise them to take alternative careers or to take, um, yeah, up a, um, to engage with additional support. Um, and, and that raises issues around sort of ethical issues as well as um, logistical and pedagogical um, issues and that we need to consider. Great, and I think you you bring in a new theme about ethics and privacy, and I think this is something we we are always talking about. Yes, we want to ensure academic success, and we want to have intervention, but how best do we do this from a, while considering privacy and ethical aspects? And and this also goes to the design. Uh, I'll highlight this, like when I was doing my experience. Like usually we design tools, but maybe we don't think much about the privacy and and the ethics perspectives and what do we do? Is this something about the policy? Is this something about the institution itself? How do we design dashboards that are considering privacy uh, aspects, both for the teachers, but also the, uh, the students? So I think that's, that's something very, uh, very helpful. And then you talk about the logistical and the pedagogical uh, challenges. Uh, and I think these are all, uh, these, these are all very, uh, these are all very, very important aspects to, to, to consider and be aware of. Uh, group six, any insights? In our group, we talked about the lack of collaboration between support and academics. So in support, for example, the support staff may have determined new uh, approaches to some of the problems that are being faced. So there might be a technology support available, but there's a lack of engagement with it. So there might be some new method available that's not taken up. Um, and that extends also to analytics. So even if we develop the learning analytics and the dashboards and so on, um, how much of that will be applied in practice and, and used to really gain insights that make differences? So the engagement between support and academics or also the, um, that there's this perception that, that academics are overworked and there are also some academics that 
are not so tech savvy and uh, basically don't want to engage with the new methods. Um, and then another problem that we discussed was uh, the, the role of plagiarism during these times of remote teaching. So even though we might be exiting remote teaching now, uh, some of the lessons learned could uh, be valuable going forward, but um, the plagiarism issues have, uh, uh, are especially hard to deal with uh, in our country because uh, of the difficulties uh, in data access and uh, the disruptions that might be going on that uh, that give the proctoring software the the wrong uh, that 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 make it hard for proctoring software to be applied. Mm. All right, that's very that's very. You talked about collaboration between support, and I think this also takes us back to the to the to the to the stakeholder involvement. And I I, I think we need to really. I mean, we may talk about so many things and I, I see like a general aspect, we are all agreeing. And I think uh, Prof. Bart will highlight even this more and how, what his experience has been. Yes, we can develop the dashboards and we can present all about dashboards, but if we want to have this in practice and implemented, how do we actually ensure that there is a synergy between the users and the developers, between the leaders and the, 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 the people on the ground? Because usually we talk about learning analytics and we know students who are like the one of the key subjects of learning analytics they provide the, they provide the information but the teachers also make use of this information to help the student or to make intervention with the students how best do we involve these two groups and make sure that it's not just a tool that is brought to them and say this is the tool is here just adopt it because taking that approach might not actually be helpful but how do we make sure that there is a kind of a synergy and we are developing a tool that's going to be owned by all the, the, the relevant stakeholders. So that's a very, that's an important aspect. And I see it's something that's cutting across uh, all the groups, uh, which is very encouraging. Uh, group seven, any, any reflections from your side? Anyone from group seven? Bradley, how many groups did you have? Maybe you don't have group seven. We, we had seven groups. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyone from group seven share their experiences? Um, we did not, I did not have uh, the chance to have a collaboration with my colleagues. I did not have access to the Google Sheet to, uh, to uh, present my thoughts on, the, on this issue. But what came to my mind is the, uh, from the managerial perspective, is student access. Uh, so students may not have the bus fare to come to campus, or they may not have the, uh, the technological infrastructure <clears throat> to, uh, to access the material that is uploaded on LMS. And uh, also, even if they do have access to the materials and the tools, the quality to evaluate the quality of time spent on the LMS is, is a challenge to me. For example, students, we can, hear, we can see the students have downloaded the material. We can see the students spend so much time on the MS, but did they really engage with the content is also one of the challenges that I think also probably need some interrogation. And then also, I don't know how to put this um, board tech language. So in the physical conduct classes, you can actually be able to interrogate board language of a student. You can see this is a yes, this is a no, uh, this is confidence and this is may not necessarily be, for example, silence doesn't mean there is no learning, but when it is in the tech, in the, in the online uh, uh, conduct sessions, this might be actually problematic. Mm. Uh, we, I think we also have plenty of data. Uh, most institutions, we may have plenty of data. It can come from baseline assessment outcomes, can come from uh, demographics, uh, number of students applying for scholarships. We can also have aging data analysis uh, from the finance department. I think we can also have a lot of insights from there, but the challenge is how do we utilize that data? Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Sanford, for that uh, reflection. And uh, 
I mean, you still bring out like the, the issue of like we're using a lot of learning management systems and there's a lot of data. Of course, we can have some uh, basic analytics from these systems telling us downloads and who, who is accessing to what. And but the thing is, how relevant is this? And as you said, the, the key issue is what about the content? What about the discourse? How do the students actually engage with the material and the that is being uh, provided to them? That's very key. That's a key analytic that could be very useful, especially for the teachers, also to assess the, the whether the curriculum or the design is actually well aligned. You have been talking about issues of learning design, and I think uh, Prof. Bat will be talking much about learning design and analytics and how these two actually connect and how best do we actually capture this kind of information. So I want to thank all the groups. I think this was very helpful. It has one thing I have learned from our discussion is that there is a lot going on and there is a lot of knowledge about learning analytics in the group. And uh, and and the thing is about like we are the things we are worrying about, especially about what kind of data, uh, how do we make this useful and how do we make the, the, the tools actually accessible or how even do we even develop tools that can be uh, taken up by teachers and these are issues that are shared uh, uh, even within the institutions that are mature in uh, learning analysis adoption and, and and that means we are almost at the same stage of how best do we actually adapt to learning analytics how best do we move uh, the analytics to to adoption in the classroom environments and how do we design tools that are going to be taken up by by teachers. One of my, uh, in one of my uh, PhD articles, I, I looked at the, how do you overcome challenges to the adoption of learning analytics at the practitioner level? And this, this, this somehow aligns with the issues we have been talking about. Yes, we have a lot of learning analytics, but how do we ensure that it's actually adopted in, the, in, the, in practice? In the literature, yes, we have been talking about, we have challenges like integrating technical and pedagogy ex expertise. I mean, how do we design tools that are pedagogically relevant, but also technic technologically robust? And to do these things, you, 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 you find that if you have programmers at the university, you also need to bring the pedagogical uh, expertise uh, together. Because if you only work with the technical people, then they're going to develop tools that are technolo technologically robust, but uh, pedagogically uh, less, less relevant. And this brings or oh, this uh, takes us to the issue of actually working with the uh, working with the different stakeholders to ensure that we develop things that are tools that are actually relevant in practice, and then the connection between learning analytics and theory. Uh, this was also highlighted by uh, uh, Ishan as one of the challenges in the field. How do we make sure that the analytics we are developing is actually connected to theory? How do we make sure that the analytics that are developed or that are produced by the tools uh, by the analytics tools or dashboards is actually highlighting what the things we need to see. Just like we, in our discussions, I saw many people talking about engagement, participation. How do you design a tool that actually captures those elements? How do we make sure that we have, we, we, we develop, someone talked about measures like, I think one of the groups talked about, uh, uh, group five talked about, uh, what are the indicators of real academic markers of success? But who defines this? I mean, we can, connect theory, we can look at self-regulation, uh, self-regulated learning, we can look at uh, constructivist learning, we can look at all these different forms of learning theories. What do they talk about successful learning? What does, what do they talk about successful student engagement or participation? And if we start, if we start from, start from there, possibly it's possible to, for us to design a tool that is actually pedagogically relevant. And if it's relevant, then it's easier for the teachers to adapt it in practice. Even if it's students, maybe it will be easier for the students to take up this kind of tool because it aligns with their practice, it aligns with theory, it aligns with their needs. And if, even if it's not just theory, but could also be working with the stakeholders, taking a human-centered approach, as I'm going to highlight, to make sure that what we develop comes from the needs of the users, needs of the users like teachers and the students. So most dashboards existing, we, they, they don't align with the teacher's practice and that's because they are devoted by tech people and they don't, don't consider too much of the, the needs of the teachers, which means in that case, they may not be taken up in practice. We talked about ethical and privacy issues. Sometimes it's about, okay, you design this tool, but how do you present this information in a way that is ethical and pre, uh, ethically acceptable? So there are so many aspects here. But some of these things can be resolved by engaging in discussions, of course, with the, with the 
institutional managers, but also the students and what kind of data can be used by teachers, for example, if, if the intention is to support students learning, do you need consent in that case? And I think the, the, the framework by uh, Ishan, uh, the Shayla Network, I think they also highlight about things like privacy. When, if you want to start analytics projects on, at, from the ground, how do you actually develop such things? Someone talked about workload. One of the groups, like sometimes the, we don't want to, to present tools that are going to, to, to add workload to the teachers. They are already overwhelmed by so many tasks, but how do we develop tools that are actually going to be taken up without, uh, uh, without considering or without uh, feeling that, okay, we are so much overwhelmed and we are taking up a lot of uh, uh, more tools that are actually adding a lot on, my, on our challenges and, uh, and uh, workload. So based on these, uh, on, 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 these, uh, on these challenges, also another thing is, is that most of the dashboards today that we have are located outside the learning management systems. For example, looking at your own institutions, of course, everybody has uh, a, pers a perspective, but if a dashboard is out there, but it's located outside the LMS or the learning management system, if you want to capture this data, uh, data about students, it's not very easy to, to actually uh, get this information for the users. So that means there is need for tools that can actually be possibly plugged into the same system, like a learning management system, maybe a Moodle or Canvas, whatever you're using. That makes it easier for the teacher, for example, to access this data or even the students, because most of the systems, they provide some information, but it's not that uh, robust uh, enough. And that's, that's why we have to develop plugins or that that provide information that is, that is uh, customized to the needs of those particular users. And then we have, of course, I talked about like best practice examples that involve stakeholders in the development of analytics are, are limited. And then, and that's why there is a, uh, a growing uh, interest in human-centered learning analytics. We develop tools that are centered on the human. And when we talk about that, that means the, the human must be involved. And these are not new things, but I think this is something in the, in the learning analytics community that is actually developing and coming up to make sure that we develop tools based on the needs of the, of the, of the stakeholders. And in that case, there is a possibility that the uptake and the issues we have been talking about, if we develop dashboards, will they be used by people? Will they be uh, taken up? Maybe that will be solved because it's, it's the, the, the dashboard itself, the tool itself is coming from their own needs. And then you work with the, with the technical people to actually develop the algorithms and the, 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 the kind of features that the users feel like they are actually interested in and it's actually touching on their pedagogical challenges and problems. So I had, a, I had this activity, but I think based on the time we have, I think I'll push on a little bit uh, for now so that we are not uh, caught by time. But if at all we get time, we may come back. So I had, I had an activity where we have different dashboards and I wanted us to look at each and every uh, dashboard to see what are the pros and cons, but the 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 the, the idea behind this activity was to look at just like we are saying, different dashboards are presented differently. But when you look at them, the visualization, the way the information that is provided, is it easier for you to interpret? Do you find it relevant? But even if we don't get time, this is something you can. This is a slide that you can revisit later and see if you are developing a dashboard. What is, what makes a good dashboard versus a, dash, a bad dashboard? Are, are you able to interpret uh, the visualizations that are actually presented uh, on the dashboard? So that's kind of, uh, that's an exercise that I expected us to engage in, but I think because of the time, I'll just push on a little bit and if we have time, we can uh, revisit this. So I'm going to take you through an example from my PhD, like based on the, on the literature we have uh, where like the result of uh, designing dashboards not based on a human-centered a human -centered approach. So in this, in this example, I try to borrow examples from human computer interaction and design-based research and human-centered learning analytics to develop a dashboard that where I worked with the teachers. So the dashboard is meant for the teachers. And what I did in my, in my doctor project was to start with the users. So I, I, I followed an approach. It was more of like a design-based research approach. So in this case, I, just like you see this uh, cycle. Uh, I started from problem identification, just like the exercise I was, uh, you engaged in. So what's the problem? That's the first thing. And then after identifying the problem, we move to 
prototyping. Like it's that is very important. We don't develop systems without testing them. So we I, we provided uh, uh, prototypes. Then we moved to high fidelity prototyping. Then we had pilot studies and then classroom use. So those were like the stages we went through. But at all stages, I was working with the with the teachers and then the technical people and of course administrators to know what kind of things do they actually want to see, what kind of information do they value as teachers and what kind of challenge do they have pedagogically that can be informed or answered by the kind of analytics that is available. So in stage one, for example, in problem identification, I'll be a little bit fast. So that's a paper, it's already published where I engage uh, teachers at two Norwegian universities through qualitative interviews uh, to ask them, what kind of things do you want to see? What kind of challenges do you have? And just like some of you, you mentioned, most of the teachers were talking about issues of like uh, capturing participation and engagement uh, in, during online discussions. So in this case, I, I zeroed to how do we support teachers to actually capture eng student engagement in online discussions? And in this case, the, the needs that were the, the analytics needs that we identified here included like social analytics, discourse analytics, and feedback analytics. So from this stage of problem identification, now we move with this problem and the needs identified by the teachers to start developing possible uh, possible solutions. And one of the things we did was uh, I shared paper prototypes. So some of the visualizations based on online discussions and I presented data based on student interactions based on social networks, who is talking to who and who is not interacting with who. And then we had visualizations based on what kind of concepts were actually used by students in uh, discussion forums. And then, and then we presented this information uh, through paper, like on a paper form, just telling teachers, could this be useful? Could this be helpful for you? And then based on this feedback, uh, I'll take you a little bit faster, but all this information is available in the papers, which I'm going to share. The teachers gave feedback about uh, one of the things that they said they, they need simplified visualizations. One of the visualizations you see here was, was uh, like an automated discourse analytics visualization and teachers felt, oh, this is too complicated. I, I want to see the concepts, but it should be as simple as possible. And it should be automated because I provided it in a paper form. So if it's presented, in an automated way and embedded within the Canvas LMS, I think this is possible. I can use this in practice. So then we moved from that stage, working with the, with the technical people at the lab here at the university to develop an automated dashboard, uh, which is, this is, the, this is the interface. So it's called uh, CADA, it's a Canvas uh, Discussion Analytics. So this dashboard provides uh, metrics about participation, students participation, the discourse that is what kind of content are they engaged in and what kind of things are they, are they talking about, network analytics, and then recently we also added uh, sentiment analysis. So it can provide the sentiment that is attached to the, con the, the, the kind of posts that students are actually providing in the, in the online forum. So this is what I, th this is the interface. Again, this is the interface I'm talking about, the tool that I developed with the, together with the teachers, but. If, when you get into the tool, if I get time, I will show you the how it, it, it does things automatically, uh, the actual interface. So when you go to this course, it gives you the content. How, what, how are students interacting with the content and how, what kind of concepts are they using in, uh, in, uh, and in, the, in the discussion? How are they interacting between each other? And then the network gives you the social network analytics and then the sentiment gives you the the, the, whether, whether the content is positive, negative, or neutral. And based on whether this is something important for you as a teacher, of course, you decide what kind of uh, aspects you actually pick up. Just like I mentioned, I based on the principles from the learning sciences uh, to develop this. Tool. So it was not just about what the teachers said they needed, but was also embedded within the theory. For example, learning as participation and master of subject specific discourse and practices mediated by artifacts. These are aspects from the social cultural perspective saying that learning is, learning is participation. So if we can capture participation, if we can show how students are interacting between each other, then we can be able to make inferences about that students are actually studying, students are engaging within content. And then in the, from the human computer interaction, we're, we're making sure that the 
the, 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 the dashboard is developed with stakeholders, but also doesn't, it, it only reduces cognitive load, not increasing it and also helping with decision-making. So when we went into the actual practice, we realized that the teachers were able to, to because we were wondering, we wanted to see are teachers actually finding this dashboard helping them to reduce cognitive load or is it just increasing it? So that was something that was done during the pilot study. So I piloted uh, this tool in two iterations uh, with uh, seven courses at the University of Oslo with 10 teachers in different iterations. And teachers used this tool in practice showing what was happening in, the, in the real time. And we were talking about like on the fly. So they were getting the visualizations or they had discussions running and then they could get the analytics in real time and they could actually make some adaptations of the course uh, based on what they see from the discussion forums in real time. Uh, uh, just like one of the, 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 the group members highlighted about uh, how do we do this in real time without, yes, we have historic data, but what about getting to know what's happening in the real time so that the, 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 the teacher or the student is actually able to make changes into the course design uh, without waiting until the end of the semester or until the end of the, 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 the course. So this, this tool was used in real time and teachers used to use it in the real class. They give a discussion, they get the analytics, they share that with us. Some shared it with the students in class, showing some of the scripts, but others also saw like misuse of uh, concepts, students on interacting as based on the learning design instructions. Like some teachers were saying, can you discuss between, between one and two other students? But sometimes when the analytics from, from the social networks came out, they, they were showing that some students were just posting uh, their, their, their posts were directed to the, to the discussion prompts, not between other students. And in that case, a, a teacher could easily see that the, 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 the analytics are not actually aligned or, or the, what students are doing is not aligned to the course objectives. And we are going to get more examples about learning design analytics in our next uh, uh, workshop, I guess. And, but this was an example of how this tool could be used in practice to provide this real-time uh, kind of analytics. So there were a couple of findings. Uh, this is a paper that has been published uh, recently. It's my last PhD article. And I, I, I present the details of the tool and the process we went through and what teachers thought about, about this process. And in brief, I can say, if you co-design a tool with the teachers we, and consider theoretical constructs, you can actually it increases the chances of making it relevant for use. And then presenting simple but informative visualizations. So you don't aim for complexity because when it's too complex, teachers don't want to look at it. And then configure, configurability, teachers should be able to customize and choose what they want. Like in this tool, teachers can choose what discussion they want. They can edit the kind of words they want to actually pick up and use. So they, 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 it's, it's, it's possible to customize a few aspects and then the teachers can actually uh, play around the tool to get what they want. And then focus on basic aspects of relevance to the teachers. As we say, like this comes from working with them throughout the, the development process, because if you don't engage them from the start, then it's very hard to know what kind of basic things do the teachers actually need so that the tool actually emphasizes that. And then learning science constructs should motivate design decision. So based on the learning theory, what kind of learning uh, constructs are you actually capturing? Is it participation? Is it engagement? Is it, uh, is, is it about use of concepts? And how best do you actually develop the analytics that are going to help you to uh, capture these kind of things? And in that case, just like I highlight, the connection between the analytics and the design are just, it's, it's supposed to be together because you can't do without the other. You can't design analytics without considering the design, without considering the intentions of the course. And then one, one, one implementation uh, lesson, I think from, uh, from my lesson was like, institutional support is key to classroom and institutional adoption, definitely. So you can't do this as a teacher alone. You may be interested, but you need the, the institution with you. You start small, work with a few teachers at the institution and then get some of the people who are really interested and keen to use such tools and then move towards uh, 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 institutional adoption and then communicate the value explicitly. Like if you can explain and tell people what this tool is really capable of doing, then it's very easy to 
um, it's very easy to uh, to to design and and uh, and uh, have tools that can actually be uh, implemented because people will know what's the value of the tool, and then peer training. If you have any training to give to the teachers, which is key, we have talked about the skills and everything. It's important that you train teachers and also as peers, not like in as individuals, because teachers usually work as a group and they can always uh, uh, help each other uh, in the process. So this is a like, kind of demonstration. I think I can do this uh, when we are having lunch break for people who will be interested. Uh, I have 15 minutes uh, remaining, and I think I would give you an opportunity to actually possibly have discussion instead of me if there is something you are keen uh, about i think it will be relevant for uh to hear from you so that i can so so that we can discuss uh, uh further about these things but i will try to pull out the 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 the, uh, the the actual tool i wanted to get a version where i can actually you can play around it but for ethical reasons i think i i, I felt to get the the version that is going to be that could be shared with you, but what I can tell you is that this tool is going to be made available to like all institutions. That means if you have a, an LMS and you are interested in adapting it to your own institutional needs or teacher needs, you can actually it will be available. I think within a month. So the lab is working on completing the open access details, so it will be available. And feel free to uh, follow up, and I will share the presentation and. If you have any questions, that's uh, my contact details. Uh, you get it from the slide. So thank you so much. I'll, for now, I'll stop sharing and welcome some questions from the audience uh, before. And then if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'm happy still to um, uh, to show you the, the tool uh, as it works in, uh, in real time. All right, Th thank you very much. Um... Um, for this informative um, 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 session. Um, so if, if there are any questions, please go ahead and ask. I, uh, I have one question that I would love to, to start um, off with. Um, so, so at the center of learning analytics, um, you know, is the learner, the improvement of their learning experience um, and learning outcomes. Now, how, you know, with the tools that you're going to be showing as an example that tool that you're going to be showing how do you ensure you know certain governance structures are in place um you know so that th these things are used solely for the intended purpose and not necessarily to build prejudice um or bias against certain learners or even against certain teachers um and and lecturers H how do you um build that and ensure that all these tools, all these dashboards are always, or at least in most cases, used for the sole purpose that they are intended for? Yeah, I think that's a very good question, Bradley. And, and I think the, 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 the bottom line for, for learning analytics and like everybody who is, in, who is engaged in this process is the transparency, right? And, and this, like for you as a researcher, transparency and also the institution. Like we have the, the fiduciary role as an institution to help learners learn, yes. And if we are designing tools to actually help us promote that, that is fine. So the whole thing is about the transparency and the trust, right? We should have, the we should be transparent and we should be uh, trustworthy about if we are designing tools, they should not be used to actually undermine or to disadvantage our students. And I, and I don't think, of course, people are using algorithms and data in so many different ways, and 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 in that case, if not used in the in the in a good way, they can actually under, uh, disadvantage certain groups. But I can say, for example, with the tool we have been developing, this is a tool that was from the start. Your intention is it's about pedagogical uh, relevance. It's about pedagogical support. It's about supporting students students learning through providing teachers with timely learning uh, timely learning analytics about what students are doing in online environments and using this information to customize the learning design and provide uh, individual feedback. So I can say from a learning analytics perspective, it's about you as, an, as a researcher, it's about you as, as, a, as an institution and, and talking about governance. The institution can develop clear policies about using learning analytics, what can you use analytics for and what and, and not. And if this is very clear, it's something, 
it can be something from an external perspective, but it can also be from an individual perspective. As a researcher, as a teacher, when you have the analytics, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an ethical issue. It, and it, it comes from you as a person. Don't use the analytics to disadvantage a student. But if that ethical aspect is not available, I mean, it's not within an individual, I can say having governance structures and having structures that are very clear about what and what do's and don'ts about the use of these analytics at an institutional level could be the key. Make sure that you have the structures, make sure that you have the policies on how best to use the analytics so that the tools that are used are specifically uh, designed and used to do or to perform the task and the purpose they actually meant for. Thank you. Um, anybody with um, a question, you may unmute. Alternatively, you may just add it to the chat. Um, Bradley and Roger, seeing that there are not a lot of questions and we have about 10 minutes left. Um, Roger, if you can do the demo, I think it will be, it might bring some more questions and people might ask some more questions, but you are more than welcome to, to, to go ahead and do the demo. Thank you. Okay. See. So I don't know whether you, uh, can you see the, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. We can see your screen. Yeah. So yeah, just just uh, just to 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 just like what I say, like I failed to get uh, the demo course, so um, please don't like take any shots like for this course because this is a real course. Uh, but I asked the teacher and he said that's fine. I can use it for demo purposes. But um, and the real oh, yeah, course. I have my... Abdul, um, I don't know the name. Um, I'm sorry. Just... Is there somebody? Are you hearing? Me? Okay, yes, now now I can. Okay, um, I actually had my hand up before Stanford, so um, I don't know, All it's right. just a very question, yeah. So right, I, right. I wanted to check with regards to the, um, the global availability of the tool, um, is it going to be open source? And then um, this is kind of technical, you're talking about we embedding it onto our LMS, so I was just thinking of when it comes to improvement and development, um, how are we going to approach that? Because now it's not it's not um, sitting in a specific um, cloud resource where it's only you know picking up the API um, using API to pick up the data from your elements. But now if it's embedded in your module pool, I know mo most times module administrators don't want to embed a new um, a different plugin because of the problem of maintenance. So I don't know if you thought we could think about all these um, kind of um, restrictions or this, um, yeah, when, when during the design phase so that we can easily integrate it onto our own LMS. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, just one thing, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I say yes, it's going to be open source. And then the thing is about the the adaptation. And I think that that really, like the institutions, the institutions are different. Like when we were working with the University of Oslo, so when we explained, they usually develop LTIs or what they call like their like plugins. So, this is something that is not a problem to at least, like we have so many LTIs. So if it's developed, it can be added as an LTI for Canvas. And if a teacher is interested, it can be added as a module uh, by the technical uh, people. So at least here, it's not, it has not been a problem, but that's the issue of maintaining that could be from an institutional perspective, which is whether the institution is actually willing to add or like have these kind of uh, tools uh, embedded within their uh, platforms and when it comes to maintaining or adapting, I think that also, as a researcher, you may not be able to like work on it on this alone. But if you are, I mean, depending on your role, still you need to work with the with the technical people, even if it's open source, because maybe you want to find a way to make changes or integrate the tool into your or make some kind of uh, function changes. But I can say. If you really need some support from a technical perspective on where the tool stands at the moment, uh, just get in touch with me because I think the technical team at the, at the university, they are more than happy to give you 
whatever support uh, that you may need to actually have you have the dashboard integrated or like whatever i know they can give you they, they can offer some minutes to do, to have to have the tool embedded within the within the within your lms but i can say working with your institutional technical people will be really key in having everything in place and i can give a very general answer on what happens an institution because this varies from institution to institution at least here it's not a problem maintaining the 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 tools and adding them to the modules you only add a module that you were interested in so it can't be there permanently you can always remove or add according to different course requirements thank you thank you uh, thank you so i i was 7 minutes over um stanford i'm not sure if that's a new hand um but for the sake of time i think um it would be wise to bring it to a close um, so that we could have our lunch and um, not necessarily delay further um, the later program. Now, thank you very much for everybody who's joined. Um, Rogers, thank you very much for this informative um, presentation. Um, and to everyone, this presentation will be shared. Um, the contact details are available at the end of the presentation. So we should be able to get hold of Rogers for some of the technical questions that we have. Now we will play some music. Um, please do enjoy your lunch. Um, and we should be back here again at um, 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 14.30. Um, so that's just going to be about 37 minutes um, as opposed to the 45 minutes. Apologies for that. Um, apologies for taking your eight minutes. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for joining. <laughs>